Um, so I guess we'll get started. And other people will watch this later. I signed a release for like everything. Um, OK, so this is a mouthful. I have a whole bunch of slides. We have fewer people. Uh, and if they weren't recording, we could go sit outside like around a table, because that's even more fun. And so maybe we can do that afterwards. Um, so as Cambria mentioned, I've been doing sort of technology research review uh, as a reviewer in IRBs for a long time. I've built technology. I've led teams to build tech. Um, and I've seen where things have gone wrong. And I've also seen how uh, these cultures and communities need to do a better job of getting to know one another so we can build better stuff and make it a lot better for everybody. So I have a lot of, here's a nonsense about stuff I've done. Um, disclosures, I think it's really important to kind of disclose relationships that you have. So I have a number of relationships I wanted to make sure I disclose. And the reason I'm disclosing them is because I'm going to use them as conversations to make the points that I'm making today. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have anything about them in this talk, but then I wouldn't be able to go into any level of detail about anything. Um, so some of the companies I work with, my company, Venture Catalyst, um, another company I'm involved with, um, Adaptive Health, it's a health technology company, um, and then a number of ones which I would have to have a disclosure about because I have some level of you know whatever, equity or, or something in them, or bought stock because it was a good idea. Um, a technology company, LifeLink, and then, of course, like the big four, uh, Microsoft, <laughs> Alphabet, <laughs> Amazon, and Apple. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're the only M among, among a bunch of A's. It's, it's fun. Uh, and then the two academic institutions I work primarily with, Memorial Stone Kettering in New York City and Baruch College, which is part of the CUNY system in New York City. OK. The most important slide of the entire talk is right here. We're, I'm going to prove this to you, hopefully, along the way. Um, but I want to always, I'm one of those people who wants to put the most important thing up front. Because if you fall asleep, or you get called away to something else, and you only watch, or you only watch the first five minutes of this conversation, this, a thousand times this. And this is the problem that, that I identified as something I was extremely worried about, which is why I've focused most of my um, IRB related work and research review and ethics work on this kind of issue. And so in going upstream and trying to help technologists, investors, and, and developers, and regulators, and others, and researchers do this better so that we don't get this wrong. OK, this is a little outline of what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about how we got here, which is a really big mess uh, that none of us had anything to do with, but we uh, sort of inherited the outcomes from. A little bit about what oversight of technology research looks like. And then we're going to talk about research ethics and under the example of digital health, um, just because digital health is the area I've worked the most in. And it's a good driving problem because it's probably the most difficult. And so you can do a lot of simplification and reduction from there in order to deal with some of the other issues. So it's probably the most regulated, most difficult. So it's the best one to kind of learn from because it gets all those edge cases. Um, a whole bunch of stuff about caution <laughs> and where things can go wrong. Uh, this, I think, is helpful because you don't know unless you've seen it. And so if we start sharing what we've seen go wrong, maybe we could make sure it doesn't go wrong again. Uh, and then the last part is, is really the pulling it all together and saying some recommendations about how you can design technology research um, in more of a team-based way and get things done in a way that makes your research better and also makes it easier to review and approve, uh, which meets multiple goals at the same time. OK, how we got here. Very simply put, most of the history of our regulations around research are reactive. They're reactive to what we would now call misconduct or abuse of people and situations where individuals and participants are vulnerable. And it's a really nasty history. Most people get really uncomfortable with it. But we need to get uncomfortable with it to understand how we got to the position we are now with the regulations we have. Um, we're not changing those regulations. We are subject to them. That's the way it is. And it's good to know that um, it came, came to us for a reason. It doesn't mean we're going to repeat this or that we're bad people or that we could have you know, been horrible and done it this way. No one's assuming that. But it just shows why we have the structure that we have. And it starts with the Nazis. It took less than 10 minutes into a conversation to say the word Nazi um, and actually have a reason for it instead of calling one one, because um, these were actual Nazis. Though the German, ex the German experiments happened um, you know, sort of as an outcropping of the eugenics movement. They did really nasty things to people. They did stuff like take people to high altitude to see how high they could go without oxygen and measure 
different things about their blood chemistry until they died. They did the same with drowning. They did the same with freezing. It was terrible. Um, after the end of the war, there was a series of trials in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, there was actually a large number of them, but people within research always think of the Nuremberg Code, which came from only one of those trials, and that was one of the trials specifically focused on the Nazi doctors. Um, oddly enough, virtually all of them were put to death, save one or two, and one of them actually continued to work in a drug company in Germany for 20 years afterwards, which is really strange, and no one really knows why this guy was spared his life. Um, so it started with that. And we got some of the things that we now call our requirements from the outcome of those trials in Nuremberg after the war. The next set of terrible things that we found were the revelation about the, the Tuskegee syphilis study that happened in uh, the early 20th century. Um, a groundbreaking research paper, or actually perspective paper, by um, Henry Beecher that talked about 22 different types of unethical experiments and why they were unethical and they were archetypes. Then we had Stanley Milgram's experiments. This was uh, pretty nasty stuff where you were recruited into research and you were led to believe that you were torturing someone um, and you were kind of getting rewarded by it, um, even though the person was not actually being tortured on the other side. Um, and that was, that was pretty, pretty awful and, of course, published and you got awards for it. Uh, and then we move on into the 70s um, or into part of the 60s where a number of terrible things happened in New York where I live um, where they did things like uh, purposely inject people uh, to make sure that they got um, uh, hep C and hepatitis uh, when they were children with Down syndrome in a group home. Uh, we had the chronic disease thing where we tried to... Um, in, make sure that people ended up getting cancer. It was a number of issues. And most shockingly, he won a Lasker Prize. And the Lasker Prize is it's kind of what they call like the baby, the baby Nobel. Many people in biomedical sciences can win a Lasker Prize. And then usually within a few years, they're being considered for a Nobel Prize. Um, sure enough, he wound up essentially getting kind of pushed out of uh, research for the, the terrible things that he did. This is not limited just to biomedical research. This is not just the kind of stuff that happens with drugs in doctor's offices. The Tea Room Trade Study was an ethnographer. So social and behavioral research, where an ethnographer was going around in San Francisco and following gay men into public restrooms and acting as a watch queen, then following them home after writing down their license plates and confronting them at the front door and saying, so about you, you know, having sex with men in these restrooms. And one of the problems was many, besides the clear invasion of privacy, um, many of those men were married with families. And so this kind of invasion was, was really rather ridiculous. Um, and so it's not just limited to you know, medical science. This is social and behavioral as well. Then we get even more recent. It happened at Stanford, the Stanford prison experiment. Um, kind of disgustingly, Lombardo is really famous and made a ton of money writing the book about the thing that he did wrong that went terribly wrong. And so he even capitalized on what he did afterwards. Um, and this one, we had students split up into guards and prisoners. And within a very short period of time, the guards ended up actually abusing uh, the prisoners and their classmates. And the, the experiment had to stop. OK. All of these things were, were either people or situations in which the individual and the participant was vulnerable. What did it lead to? This is sort of the, the brief regulatory history of how we got to all the, all the things we have today that we are subject to. Um, we had the Nuremberg Code that came from, I believe it was trial number 11 in the Nuremberg uh, trials after the war. We have the um, Declaration of Helsinki in the 60s. Then we get the National Research Act. This is actually what created a thing that we now call the IRB formally. Um, although the FDA did something in 66 that actually looked like it created the precursor to it. And then we have a number of other things. We are now under the, what we typically call the common rule. The common rule is called the common rule because a whole bunch of federal agencies decided they were going to abide by one rule in common. And boringly, they decided to call it the common rule. Um, and there, there is currently a revision of the common rule that's going to take effect uh, in, was supposed to take effect in January. <laughs> It got delayed twice. Um, they say it's going to take effect in January of 2019. 
Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, but we, we have this history of things that has occurred. The important one that I think many researchers ought to try to remember is the threefold thing we got from the Belmont Report, which is this idea of autonomy um, or respect for persons, justice, and risk benefit or bene beneficence. And um, it, it was interesting because they had 60 some odd different ethical norms and theories and things that they were thinking were important. And they kind of said, gee, we don't think anybody will remember all these or be able to do it. And they whittled it down to these three. Um, if you ask me, they're probably missing a good one. But uh, you know, this is better than nothing. Um, so what are we missing? I believe they're missing something that they wouldn't have had the presence of mind in 79 to actually put in, which is there's a researcher, um, I believe she's now retired, her, her name is Carol Gilligan, who was at Brandeis, who is nominally credited with um, the sociological study of the ethics of care and interconnectedness, and I, I think that's probably the fourth one we need um, in, in addition to these three. But uh, I don't think she was quite, uh, quite famous enough yet uh, when, they ca when that came out to consider it. Um, but that's probably number four. But so those were all these terrible atrocities. Now, here's the earliest one that I found that's not typically talked about that much, which is in the turn of, uh, well, at the end of the 19th century, we were in the Spanish-American War in the United States, and there was this, as I believe the Washington Post would nicely pointed out, this sort of crack-brained idea that, um, that black people had an increased level of immunity to yellow fever. And so they created what they called immune regiments. That was actually the name of them. It was a, a number of black uh, enlisted individuals. And they sent them into places with high amounts of yellow fever in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Uh, what happened? Well, it's racist, pernicious, and disgusting to believe that somebody has more immunity because, based on the color of their skin. Uh, many of them died. And it was a, an atrocity. And this was experiment. Um, and so this was us doing research without consent um, on our own soldiers uh, and sending them places. It was pretty terrible. And this, by the way, the reason I discovered this was I was in South Carolina for a wedding maybe 12 years ago. And this plaque talking about that immune regiment is at the South Carolina State House. Um, and I saw it, took a picture of it, and I said, I wonder what this is all about. Um, turns out that's what they were doing. So we've had these kinds of problems for a very long time. These are the most serious but they led to our reactionary policies that we have that show the framework that we're operating under. Um, and while nobody ever expects anyone to do something this terrible, it gives a sense of why the environment looks the way it is for how we have to oversee research. Um, it was not created holistically, it was created in a reactionary way. So I just said, this is all about vulnerability. It's about people who are vulnerable and situations who are vulnerable. What does vulnerability mean? You don't have to read all these now. You can come back to this later. The point is that they're all different. And these are a number of different international guidelines and other things, many of which you are party to um, and have to abide by, especially as a global company. You operate in a, a variety of environments, nominally everywhere on the planet, and you may be subject to these kinds of definitions. Um, there's not total harmony between them. Um, they have different variations of saying the same thing about we should care about this and we should do a good job with it and we should mind it. What are the effects of vulnerability when it comes to research? The, the, these are the things we're actually really worried about. Worried about physical control, worried about um, coercion, undue influence, and, uh, and manipulation. These are not things that people ever want to be accused of. And they're not things that any researcher in their right mind would ever be designing something to try to do. It can happen primarily by accident or through not thinking through things in a very broad way. Uh, that's why we have to have more conversations have, uh, between other people and have review boards that will help us think through things um, a little more holistically. Uh, and so you want to have research that doesn't do these things or minimizes them to such a level that they're not a problem. OK. In our regulations, of which you guys are subject to here in the United States, the common rule, et cetera, when you do research on humans, we have definitions of who's vulnerable. And they're written in such a way to say, OK, children are vulnerable. People are not the, at the age of majority. Um, and if I asked everybody what you thought the age majority was, 
How many of you would say 21? Anybody say 21? Nobody. 18. A couple hands for 18. Anything other than 18? The answer is it depends. Because if you're seeking medical care and you're a woman um, and you're seeing medical care related to something like contraception or a woman's health issue, you can actually get that and have con consent as an adult prior to 18 in many states. You can drive a car at 16. You can smoke cigarettes at 18. You can drink alcohol in the United States at 21. The age of majority on a given thing is not completely fixed. It may be fluid and it may have laws and jurisdictions that change it. You're allowed to get married at age 16 and even 14 in some states in the United States. In case any of you want to become a child bride, right? 14 in Rhode Island, I believe, right? Um, so these things are not fixed. And we have regulations that talk about research on children. We have regulations that talk about research on pregnant women, fetuses, and neonates. We have, research, we have regulations that talk about research on prisoners. Um, those are the ones that are explicitly written in there. But it's not just the pathology of a human being, their characteristics that actually matter. We need to go a step further because you could imagine there are situations in which people might be vulnerable. And that's what we're typically talking about um, when we say going beyond sort of the regulatory meeting to something more broad that's a little more useful. And in, uh, the President's Commission actually said that and said, you know, this really matters. It's really situations in addition to um, characteristics. And so what, are, what could that mean? Instead of having these group-based definitions, you might want to have um, situations as well. You could have multiple vulnerabilities at the same time. You could have pregnant minors. Um, you could be studying uh, homeless people who are mentally ill. Um, it is not covered in the regulations that somebody with a mental illness is automatically vulnerable. But you could imagine cognitive impairment creating a vulnerability where someone is unable to protect their own interests. And so that's true. You could also imagine that someone who is homeless or, or socioeconomically disadvantaged compared to the society in which they're living and the context in which they're living not being able to protect their own interests. And so these, these sort of thoughts around vulnerability are really important for us as we design research, as we design technology that's going to be used by everybody. Because um, let's face it, as a global company, you're creating things that are going to be used by everybody. You, know, you can't just be like, yeah, no, 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 there's going to be these people over here in this one neighborhood you know, in rural India. No, no, it's going to be everywhere. Um, so we need, to be, we need to be more broad and more circumspect about this. Now, how do you figure out what kind of protections you want to build in or, or try to wrap your head around this? You, you probably want to know whether the research you're doing is actually targeting a group or a situation in which people might be vulnerable. In those cases, you really need to understand it very well and you need to design mitigating factors or, or other things uh, to reduce that. But it also might not be targeted. And so in the cases where it's not targeted, you want to be generally you know, good about your design, um, but you're not necessarily doing research on vulnerable people if you're not targeting them. So you, know, know, you should know whether or not you're really focusing on that. Uh, the fact that someone may, um, may be pregnant has nothing to do with whether or not um, they're capable of providing consent to show you how easy it is to click things on a touch screen. It's totally irrelevant. So there doesn't need to be any additional protections for a pregnant woman uh, who's doing that. In fact, pregnant, pregnancy is not by itself a vulnerability. Why? I don't know. Half the population are women, and women get pregnant because that's how you reproduce and have more people on this planet. It is not automatically a pathologizing thing that they are vulnerable because of that. They are no less capable of making informed choices and protecting their own interests just because they're with a you know, fetus and are going to have a child. So we, we need to be thinking about whether or not it really matters in some of these circumstances. And so this targeting idea um, helps answer that question. OK, so that's a little bit of backstory of how we got to where we are, why vulnerability really matters. Um, it's really good to use because it often teases out edge cases. It is people who develop technology. Edge cases are your friends. Um, because if you can manage the edge cases, then usually what you're building will not break, or it will break a lot less frequently. <laughs> so we really, we really can be uh, using this kind of framework uh, in a way that I think is understandable to people who develop technology and do research on it. So how do we do this oversight? 
Okay, we have IRBs. We know what they we know what they are. They review research in humans. One of the things that I've been teaching people about research oversight um, and technology is to think about bucketing things. Are you doing research that is something that people are simply unfamiliar with? This is the most common. If you're reviewing research, you may not be familiar with what that particular group or individual is doing. Cool, we're all really smart people. We can learn. People on IRBs are smart. They're very capable of learning and learning quickly. And so you're merely just describing something to somebody who's unfamiliar with it. That's a teaching moment. That's easy. The second one is stuff that's better technology of the same old thing. We have lots of structures that allow us to review quite readily most types of research in this world. In fact, I think just about all of them. And some of it is just new ways of doing old stuff. When I was a little kid, our standardized tests were with Scantron and a number two pencil. Some people, after that, started to do them on desktop computers. After that, it might have been laptops. Then it might have been touch screens. Uh, I'm waiting for the point at which we have a voice-enabled you know, quiz that people take, right? But we're still just doing answering questions. It still is probably survey methodology. Um, we've been doing that for thousands of years, ever since we figured out how to write. Um, so we're using better and new technology to do the same old thing. Uh, and if that's the case, we already have structures for it. So um, most of what I think people are doing in technology research can fall under this. Better way to do the same old stuff. Wonderful. That means we know how to handle it. Um, the last one, and from somebody who's been an IRB chair at a hospital and reviewed research for a long time, this is the one that's really fun. I mean, they're all fun, but this one gets really interesting. And when you do something that's actually novel, an emergent property of a new system or platform, um, a useful and interesting combination of different pieces of tech or new data types that you can actually gather that prior to this nobody could ever gather, that's when stuff is novel and interesting. And you usually have to go into a little more detail, and there's a little more learning to figure out how to apply rules to it to make sure that it's covered. So in, in terms of you know, ease to difficulty in review, and therefore ease to difficulty in how you want to take care in writing protocols so you explain what you're doing, top one's the easiest. You're teaching somebody about something they just didn't know about, great. Second one is a, li is a little harder because you probably just have to make the correlations for them really obvious. We're doing you know, something that we've done for hundreds of years, but we're just doing it in a better, more efficient, or technologically supported way. Or at the, at the gold end, we're doing something that's really novel. This is different. And not novel in the sense of like you just want to tell people you're doing something cool, like actually novel. <laughs> um, you know, patentable kind of novel, that level of novelty. OK, so how do, we get, how do we get through this problem? I've always thought of this as a science and technology policy issue. It, we already know that we accept, we accept the premise that technology is in continuous development, so stuff is going to continue to grow and go forward. Um, so we can't look at it in a stagnant way, especially as reviewers. We need to take our current regulations and overlay them and try to understand how we can do things within the boundaries we already have so it can become efficient and easy for the researcher as well as easy for the reviewer to be able to do it and ensure that the participants are being protected. And then the last part is trying to find flexibility. This is the hard part. You really kind of have to know stuff pretty well, and this is what you would be relying on your IRB, uh, Cambria, and others for, is to try to find the flexibility so that you can advance things forward without them standing in your way, but also that they're able to do their job to protect the participants and provide you with structures that help make your research both better um, and flourish. So there's a, you can tell there's an interplay here that, that I'm sort of arcing towards. OK. At a very basic level, you all know this. You're going to go create a digital solution. You probably got a team, and you got something you want to build. I come from healthcare, so we're going to talk about it in the context of, of digital health and healthcare. This is an interdisciplinary problem. People from Silicon Valley and people who create technology have a different way of going about their work than people who, who have classically done research on humans for time immemorial. Um, medical investigators, social and behavioral scientists. These are people who have kind of have a, a way of doing this. And then the people who review it. We haven't had as much technology research go through IRBs as we have in the last 10 years. And it's going to just continue to rise. And so everybody kind of needs to meet in the middle. Um, this isn't a new problem. Interdisciplinarity is difficult. There are people who have written a lot about how to try to do work within it. Um, all of that stuff is useful. You have to court one another, and you kind of have to get to know one another. Um, you know, put your swords down, right? 
So what are some of the things you can do? Try to understand each other's cultures and the way that you operate. I had well, I ran a, a group that was doing research on a six-sided virtual reality facility to create um, software to be able to interact and investigate protein structures. I'm a biochemist, and so that was interesting to me. And I was working with a virtual reality programmer, a mechanical engineer, and a UX designer, a visual artist, um, and a few others. We had a very diverse team of people who all come from different uh, backgrounds and practices. And one of the things, it was probably the most important thing that I made an effort to do was to learn what I would call the 100 terms of their field. Try to understand the 100 important terms of the work of your colleagues so that you can respect and honor their contribution to the work and try to keep it interesting for them and show that effort. And then encourage them to learn about your field so that you can all be working together, hopefully with some unified terminology so you don't talk across one another, but also to recognize that, that there's so much that you need to be able to manage in those processes. Um, the second part is that we need to actually f identify and fill holes in some of these teams. And this is hard to do. I think at Microsoft you might have a better chance at this than other people because you seem to be more fluid in the way you create and collaborate in your teams. Um, so the more fluid you are in that and the more willing people are to sort of jump in and help, usually the better this becomes. Because when you identify a hole, if there's no ego about it, you can say, oh, we're missing something. Let's find someone who's good at that to work with us. And let's, you know, let's share the load. Um, so that is something that, that sometimes even IRBs will actually kind of look at and say, you know, you don't have somebody to think about this issue, and you probably should. Um, and so IRBs can be a helping to identify that, though it's not their primary role. It's just when you're reviewing research, you often will see it. Okay, one of the things that uh, technological development has done that I think is really marvelous, we're gonna see even more of it, is change the way we design research. And nowhere is this more interesting to me personally um, because it affects my work and I'm seeing a lot of it is in healthcare technology. Oftentimes the platforms themselves are really novel ways of conducting research and have novel designs to them because we've uh, we've changed the environment in which we're um, conducting the research and therefore some of the limitations we had on design uh, may either go away or may change. And so you can do a lot more and we're seeing a lot more interesting research designs. And I wanted to go over one example. I mean, so every specialty is trying to integrate technology into it within medicine, within human medicine, um, and then to a lesser extent in, in veterinary medicine. So it, we're seeing a lot of this happen. And you know it's got a few different categories, but it's essentially through the whole pipeline from research to care. Um, one of the studies that I am currently an investigator on and, and running is doing some stuff like this. And it's a good example to talk about the, the different types of design. So it is a, a virtual trial, We're recruiting 4,000 people, 1,000 in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and, and Los Angeles, respectively. And they're going on to a website and then registering for a research study and consenting through a conversational chatbot. And then they, uh, once they've gotten consented into the study, there's demographic information um, taken about them and a number of questions are asked about who they would want to return genetic testing results from, whether they're a primary care provider, they can tell us who it is, or whether they'd like it to be returned by a medical geneticist. Um, we're recruiting for Ashkenazi ancestry Jewish populations. They are at a 40 times higher risk of, of having mutations that could cause an increased risk for breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and fallopian and ovarian cancers. These are not the kinds of things you ever want to get. Um, so we're doing this population screening. It's technology supported. It's a virtual trial. And it's actually really quite fun and interesting. So what I want to show you is the actual chatbot. And so this is the kinds of stuff that we're starting to see in healthcare technology that's really interesting. So you can go onto the website to sign up for the study. Um, we tried to use like really straightforward resign, you know, big button register now. Um, and it, what it does is it, it pops you in to a chatbot. And so this chatbot actually will walk you through the consent process. And it's interactive, it's got videos on it, it goes through modules where it teaches people about the basics of um, genetics and about what 
potential results could be of these type of genetic testing. So it's very different from direct-to-consumer genetic testing. This is actually done through cancer centers with the support of genetic counselors um, and education and training integrated into it. And so this is not your typical type of consent. It's going to walk you through these things, and it's very interactive. It requires you to actually do stuff, right? And it'll even show you videos and, and ask you questions to confirm your understanding of the information that you're being given. Um, that is something that we have historically never done, but now we have these kinds of things that can allow us to attempt to do that. So we can start to do a lot better with the work that we're doing. So we could go through this if you want. It, 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 it's, it goes for a pretty long while. There's videos and, and animations and you name it. And of course, I lost my space. OK. So as you can see, we've got an entire platform that is a study design. And so there's a number of very interesting looking specific aims for that research study that we're doing that I just showed you the, the online system for. Um, we're trying to see whether or not primary care providers feel comfortable returning genetic testing results to their patients. So we ask them. We give them the choice. We say, your patient has enrolled into this research study to get genetic testing done. Do you feel comfortable returning the results to your patient? If you do, please indicate yes, we, and we're happy to support you in it, provide you with information, training, and, and live support from a genetic counselor, a medical geneticist who can talk to you and help you, you know, learn about and feel comfortable returning these results to your patient. And if they say no, then we do it. And we've used a system to actually make this a lot easier for us. We track all of it. For certain types of results, they can be returned directly to the person. And so the person could go through this online system, walk into a, a blood testing center. This is fully integrated with a place called Quest. It's a blood lab place. And so all they do is they, they go through this consent process. And then they can walk in, and the system already has it. It gets the blood drawn, and they walk out. They've never seen an investigator. They've gotten training, we've confirmed that they know what they're doing, they've given consent, and they've had the research activity all on their own. Um, some might think that recruitment would be actually pretty slow for this, you know, that people wouldn't be willing to do it. We recruited almost 2,000 people in four months, which is really insane. <laughs> it was really fast, it was really quick, it seemed to work, it had good design. Um, so we actually are, are noticing that when done properly, and I think we're just sort of at the tip of the iceberg on this, um, I think it's a very good example. Is it perfect? Probably not, because it's the first time we've done something like this. <laughs> so I'm sure it could be better. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for us in, in sort of this, this milieu to do a better job. OK. What about all the protections that we need for this kind of work? Unfortunately, it's not one size fits all. Everybody always wants a quick answer. Um, anybody who's been in science long enough knows that when you ask a good question, the answer is always, it depends. And that's still the answer. It depends. Um, you really need to consult your IRB. Like, really. Um, they're going to be your friend. They're going to frustrate you sometimes, but your work's going to be way better when you get in early and often and have the conversation. It'll, you'll have better designed research and ultimately better designed products and services um, when you have people who help you navigate that. And the protection requirements may vary depending on a few different things. Um, so that's just a kind of a framework that you just kind of need to have. I want to go through a few of the standard things that are, seem to come up much more frequently, technology research. Uh, privacy protections. How many of you have taken some sort of training on privacy? Yes, the answer is everybody. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm not sure they would ever let you in this building, right? Uh, so, of course, you've gone through all kinds of training on privacy. We have real definitions for privacy when it comes to protecting um, human subjects. Privacy is about people. I always tell people this. Privacy is about people. It's about their private space, their expectations, whether, they're, whether you're welcome, whether you're trusted, all of these things. And so you need to have an understanding of the impact of the research that you're doing and whether or not you have any privacy concerns. You can have privacy concerns. That's OK to have them. What's not OK is to either pretend they're not there or not do anything about them. You can acknowledge that there's a privacy concern and then say how you're going to handle it or how you plan on mitigating it. 
and how you plan on disclosing it to the person who's participating. If you do those things, you're probably going to be fine. Why? Because if you tell people what you're going to do and you tell them what the risks are and they're fully informed and they get it and they know how you're trying to you know, protect them from the bad things that are happening and how you're trying to honor them, they're going to trust you. And that's a good thing. So these are not things that you need to be scared about or try to hide. They're things that you should surface and deal with um, and do it in a way that just makes your life easier. Where do they come up? The most common places they come up are in recruitment, consent, um, in some of the procedures, and then in some of your research methods. And, you know, for example, if you think about social media research, there's a lot of privacy concerns around social media research. And a lot of it has to do with the methods and the way you're going to do it. It's like, oh, I'm going to get access to your Facebook page. Great, okay. You can ask somebody for permission to do that, but you should tell them what you're doing in pretty gory detail and for how long. You know, you can't just say, we would like access to your Facebook page to see how things are going with you from time to time, but then in reality, you've scraped the entirety of their Facebook page since 2005 and then put it into a database. That's probably going to violate their privacy and not really telling them what you're actually doing. So you probably need to be more descriptive in, in some of these cases of what you're doing. Confidentiality is the second one. Privacy is about people. Confidentiality is typically just considered to be about data. Um, you have lots of training in that. I'm assuming everybody here, again, you weren't allowed in this building unless you probably have been trained in confidentiality and in data breaches and in data privacy and data protection. And so there's a lot of things that IRBs are mandated to look at around this too. Um, so it's something that we can design with and we can do a better job um, and we can work together on it in ways that actually make it, make it feasible. So really what often people are most worried about at the far end is data breaches. And we've had a number of breaches that have happened in the last few years that have been very public in this world, right? Um, we had the Equifax breach. We've had EMRs, electronic medical record systems at hospitals held hostage by people. These are things that really do concern people. And so the more we think about it up front and use procedures that are consistent with sound design and then have reasonable expectations and talk about those risks, and have adequate, what we consider adequate provisions for it, the better. No one's asking you to create something insane. They want you to demonstrate that you've thought it through, you've got a plan, you've written it down, and you know how to handle it if something's going to happen. And handling it might not be the way you think it is. Handling it could even include, in the event that we have a data breach, our process is this. We notify the IRB, we call the information security officer, and we have a huddle to figure out what to do next. You write that into a protocol, you're good. Because you, you've demonstrated a knowledge about, hey, this is how we're going to approach the problem. No one expects you to know exactly how some data breach is going to occur or exactly how you're going to respond to it minute to minute. We want to demonstrate you have this understanding that we are going to react in an appropriate manner. And here are the steps we're going to take. Um, so it's a, usually a lot easier than people fear <laughs> um, that it is to create these kinds of protections. Okay, so we've talked about where we, how we got here and vulnerability. We talked a little bit about sort of the generalized oversight of technology research and some of the, the large issues, right, data security and privacy, et cetera, and confidentiality. And now we're going to actually dig in onto the, the classic research ethics part of it. We use digital health as an example just because it's got most of the corner cases that you'll ever find, um, and a number of things are actually instructive for other types of technology research. Um, and then I'm talking about it because it's the area I've spent the most time. Uh, I don't design, I'm not a UX designer, so I'm not going to talk about it from, from, um, from that standpoint. Um, you know, and I don't spend my time doing machine learning, so I'm not going to talk about it from that standpoint either. Um, Classically, in research ethics, remember I mentioned that Belmont report. We've got these three big pillars that we talk about, autonomy or respect for persons, beneficence, which is the risk-benefit ratio, and then justice. And we're going to talk about issues and opportunities uh, in research ethics and, and digital health or health technology research uh, related to these three things. The first one is autonomy. Uh, and in here, the most interesting stuff lately has really been around consent. And one thing that I've had to drive home really, really, really strongly with technology companies that I've worked with and others is the concept that a EULA is not a consent form. 
And it's almost, I, I almost want to have this on a mug and like give it to people or make t-shirts um, because it's really, really, really important. Uh, a EULA is not a consent. And you need to look no further than what happened with Facebook where they buried in the EULA the fact that they would do research on people um, and they considered that to be consent. And then, you know, it didn't quite go so well. They, they really kind of got, uh, got their nose bloodied around this. And I don't think they did it to be cruel and I don't think they did it to be mean. Uh, I don't think it was malicious in any way, shape, or form. It just happened to be that way, but they really aren't. Our regulations to say how we're supposed to provide consent, the kinds of things we're mandated to do, and give us a posture that's much more interactive and much more transparent. And so an end-user licensing agreement that's in size 7 font that you just click is not really going to do that. And ultimately, it, what I really think is probably true is that our regulations, which is 45 CFR 46, or if you're doing FDA, 20, FDA 21, um, they are probably going to win if that ever goes to court against a EULA. Because there's no federal code that talks about EULAs, but there is a, when it talks about consent for research. And so we need to be careful about these contradictions between EULAs, for a device, or EULAs for a SaaS platform, or EULAs for a social media platform, and the consent forms that we write. And how do we get some clarity on that? We actually really need our IRBs to help with this, and they can be the people that can coordinate working with legal and others to try to get that done properly. Because you don't want that kind of stuff to stand in the way of you doing research, but you also need to do it right. And it may impact your design, it may impact the things that you tell and ask participants to do when they're doing research that you're, that you're running. And so we need to do that stuff early, and we need to be very involved in that process in an open-minded way with others. We're going to learn a lot as a, a community of people that do research and technology around these issues in the coming years. Um, but if you want to get out ahead of it, don't assume that a EULA can say whatever it wants and that you can mandate people to sign it, or that it is sufficient for research consent, because it's not. Um, so that's a, a pretty important point that I hope you'll take away, and it'll save you a lot of grief if you think about it that way. Um, it'll also reduce risk for you and your participants. So the other part of this autonomy piece was something that I got to work on a few years ago when I was still a professor at Mount Sinai and one of the IRB chairs at the hospital. And it was a research kit application. So the research kit came out. Um, they had four apps that came out initially. It's an SDK that Apple released to allow to do mobile medical research on the, on the iPhone. Uh, the one that I had worked on was around asthma, and it had sort of symptom tracking and some other nice integrations. It also did, um, it did some notifications to you based on your location, um, looking up National Weather Service data and telling you about pollen counts because one of the big triggers for asthmatics happens to be pollen in the air and air quality. Um, and so it was really quite fun. This was a minimal risk research study. It was a, well, capturing a lot of data and then just telling them some information. There was no medical intervention. There was no doctor telling them something. There was no prescriptions or anything like that. Um, we had these wonderful enrollment numbers. Uh, that huge ballooning number of 43,000 something people, um, that's what happens when Tim Cook like, points at your app uh, at like, a big conference and goes, look at this. And then like, you just watch your enrollment like, go up like that. Um, uh, oddly enough, so I, I worked on and wrote a bunch of this protocol. Um, I had this sneaking suspicion, though they never told us, that Apple might do something like that. And so I wrote into their recruitment that it may be included in the Worldwide Developer Conference or in an Apple keynote, including um, it may be announced uh, by the CEO of Apple. And therefore, we thought our recruitment numbers could include tens of thousands of people. What was wonderful about me writing that one paragraph in our recruitment, we never had noncompliance. <laughs> Because we predicted that that might occur, and we wrote it in there, so we didn't get in trouble for like having our enrollment go I don't know nine thousand times what it was going to what we initially thought. Um, so what did we do in this from a from an autonomy standpoint? The thing I was the most heavily involved in, and I continue to be involved in now, is how do we do consent on mobile devices, and how do we do consent on tablets and other computers, and you take advantage 
of the technical solutions we have to improve our consenting process. Classically, consents for research are on pieces of paper. And they're long, and they're ugly, and they're legalistic, um, and people barely read them, and they just kind of go, yeah, 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 and they skip to the end, and they sign it. You don't really want that. That's not really informedness. So how can we use technical solutions to actually make that process better? I think this is a useful thing to do with technology. And so we had a number of things in the research kit SDK to kind of do this. And one of the things we came up that was come up with um, by Sage BioNetworks was heavily involved in it. They're here in, in Seattle. Uh, and Apple and, and a few others and, and myself were these, this idea of layered and participant-centric um, consent and layered consent. So you would have each section of the consent form would have you know, sort of an icon and a quick one sentence, which was the, the terse, this is what this is all about. You know, we're going to protect your data and keep it secure. Right? That's the, the, the end thing you want someone to get when they read a section about data security. right? You want them to feel like you're going to protect their data. You're going to honor that. OK, so boom. First layer, an icon, simple statement about it. And then you can click and you can read more. And when you read more, it would have more detailed information like you would get in a standard consent. You can flow through this in a way that, that makes it really easy. And then you can capture a signature. And then you can route this back. Wonderful, right? Sounds like a good thing. I thought that was neat, but I actually think we could do more. I think that's not enough. That's still very passive, right? I'm just going to swipe through some screens. It looks a lot like the, you know, let's tour the functions of an app when you first load a new one, right? The app tour, um, and someone just shows you a bunch of screens. What are you doing? You're like, no, 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 I know what I'm doing, even though we don't. And then we go skip right through, and then we go on to the app. I said, no, I think there's more that we can do here. I think it needs more interactivity. I think it needs a summary, and this is actually a regulatory thing. Tell me everything in like three sentences up front or four sentences up front. What is this all about? Give me a sense of what I'm talking about here in the beginning. I think summaries are really useful. Um, I think we need easier ways to create, edit, and deploy these. You know, we need real systems so that we can make this more efficient. I don't think we should be having it so that they're hard-coded into each application. That's silly. Um, we know how to do this, right? And I think there's another of other issues that, that we can solve. And so these are the things that, that I've spent a lot of time, probably in the last two years, trying to address. Because um, I think we need it, and I think we can easily do it. I don't think this stuff is actually all that hard. Um, so it was a good start you know, that Apple got this going, um, but I think we can do better. So when we think about informing this, and we think about trying to have people understand information, um, and know what they're signing up for and agreeing with. We know from a lot of the literature in education, especially around adult learning, that people learn in different modalities. Um, some of you may be very visual learners. You might like graphics and charts. Some may be very text-based learners and like to read paragraphs and things. And some of you, very few of you, though I'm guessing I'm, uh, here at Microsoft probably a larger percentage than others, may actually really understand things like equations really well. You know, there's the classic statement that if you uh, put an equation into a presentation, you lose half the viewers each time you put an equation in. Um, but some people are, are much more technical in the way that they learn. And if we're going to be recruiting participants into research, we should acknowledge that reality from an entire field of inquiry and maybe see how we can use tech to do a better job of it. And so what I came up with, which is, you know, if it's wrong and people hate it, they can blame me and my name's on it. So they can come flog me with a rubber chicken. Um, is that I think we need to have at least three modalities, and this can include quiz questions that confirm with the person, you know, that they understand what you've just talked to them about. Um, charts, videos, uh, text, um, some sort of interactivity. Uh, I think those, if you use up to three of those, or at a minimum three of those, you probably have increased your chances of informing the participant. Um, and I think we can do that now. And it was fun because I, I've been saying this for a few years now. And I, I finally got somebody from the FDA when they were talking about some of the regulations of mobile technology um, in research actually sort of mentioned it in one of their talks. And the best I got from them in a the talk was they said, well, we don't mandate this. It's really not a bad idea. And that was about as good as you're going to get. You know, it's like, great, I, I will accept the compliment of a double negative from the FDA. Um, so what are some of the benefits you actually get from this? This seems nice, and some people may be like, yeah, yeah, yeah that sounds good, but what is it really going to do? 
Electronic consenting, when you do some of this, I think has a number of really important benefits. It can deal with low literacy and low numeracy. If you have somebody that's lower literacy, um, but you do short video segments that explain things through a mobile device, you've just gotten around the literacy issue because you're talking to them. They don't have to read through it. Um, low numeracy, if you show graphics that are representative and informative, may get around that. So there's a lot of different ways that we can actually provide value here. You can make it so that someone could proceed at their own pace, stop, come back to something. Um, you can make it so that someone might have access to it at all times. If you're in a research study where they're doing something that's interventional or investigative, and something happens, you trip, break your ankle or something, you wind up in the hospital, and you want to tell the doctor that you're in a research study, cool. With electronic consenting systems and apps, you could have that consent on your phone and be able to show it to the clinician. You'd be able to share that information a lot more readily. You'd be able to remember the stuff you're involved in. Most people, when they sign up for research, if they're given a paper consent form, lose it or throw it away in the first 48 hours. <laughs> it's like, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere at home. Or, oh, it went out with the recycling along with uh, the Sunday New York Times from last week. Right? So these kinds of things, I think we have an opportunity to create stuff that's way better um, and actually provide some real value to people and reduce headaches. OK, so that was a couple years ago. Where are we now? What kinds of things are we doing? I already showed you one. That was the first conversational chatbot used for informed consent for a virtual clinical trial. And we started, we opened enrollment in March, and we're like halfway through our enrollment four months later. It's wild. And it seems to be working. And we, we went through the process of we're asking follow-up questions about their, how, you know, how they liked it, what they understood, what they didn't, et cetera, um, to see if this is really a viable option for people. And so far, it, it's looking like it is. It, it, it seems to be working. Uh, we also have analytics about the funnel of how many people try and how many people complete, et cetera, and it, and it looks, looks really pretty nice. Um, we've also built some more stuff uh, and the number of those features of interactivity um, into, uh, into a consent platform um, for a piece of tech that I've been working on with another company. And we can do things like have you know, finger-based signatures. Um, we can have it generate PDFs that are locked and timestamps so you can track and audit your consent forms. We can have it so that they can easily email them to different parties. And so let's say that you sign up for something, but you want to share it with a different doctor because you've got more than one. Seamless to send it. Um, so we, we're pushing forward on these things, but this is relatively new. Um, and this is not just, I've taken a document, I've turned it into a PDF, I'm giving a stylus to sign, right? Uh, we're doing interactivity. We've got the ability to create videos and put them in, ask quiz questions, uh, personalize different sorts of charts and things. So it, it's heading in a very fun and interesting direction. And all of this is how I think we can increase autonomy and protect subjects uh, in the conduct of research. Um, and it's using, you know, best-in-class tech, the kinds of stuff that you guys build here. Okay, so that was pillar one. That was e-consent, and we're talking about autonomy. Then we've got risks and benefits. So this is one of those things that I've noticed over time, and this list keeps growing. These are risks that I've commonly observed that happen in technology research and health. But some of them, I think, are just happen in technology research in general, particularly with mobile devices. Um, the first is you know, your privacy and confidentiality risks. And these are usually much more closely tied to the implementation of the, of the, the solution that you're actually creating um, or the device that you're creating. And you know, if you're collecting GPS data, if you have IP addresses, uh, those kinds of any sort of location-based service, sensor data that could be identifiable because you could actually understand a pattern of like, well, this sensor is indicating that like maybe you're walking up uh, you know, up a really long hill at a grade for a long time, oh, you might be hiking, right? And so you might be able to actually identify things and you might have additional or odd privacy and confidentiality concerns that are much more closely tied to the technology itself. This is not true in standard research that doesn't use tech. Privacy and confidentiality are like boilerplates in most hospitals and healthcare systems because they're like, oh, you're physically coming into the research setting into the hospital and sitting down with someone and doing something. Your privacy and confidentiality is just of the building and we kind of know what it's about. It's not following you around in the world and in the environment that you're in. So it's much more closely tied to the tech. 
The second one here is collecting information from or about bystanders. So you want people to take selfies of themselves every day for the next three years. Why? I don't know. You want to see how their affect changes over time. You want to see what their choices are. You know, you name it. There could be any number of reasons why you might do something like that. Well, what if in 50 out of the, you know, 900 to 1,000 of them, there's like a person in the background that you can see? Well, well you collected some information about bystander. That's probably identifiable. Um, what are you going to do? There's a risk that that could happen. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. You could actually solve that by saying, OK, in our protocol, if we ever get images that have people in the background, we're going to automatically process the image, identify the person that w that's part of the study, and then either crop out or obscure the other person in our data. That's totally fine. You can do that. You're allowed to do that. You don't even have to automate it if you want. You want to do it you know, manually. I mean, that sounds boring, but like you could. So, these are the kinds of things that, that could come up. And then the last one on here is about consent legitimacy. This is something that often gets asked in the IRB context. Is the person who we think they are? Um, we haven't seen a huge spike in people trying to spoof uh, for research. It could happen. Uh, it's often linked to just how risky the research is. If you have something that's really high risk research, maybe you want to have some sort of technical solution to confirm someone's identity. Um, but we don't usually have a lot of that kind of non-compliance. And so the more we see it, the more maybe we'll have to develop technical solutions to resolve it. But to date, I haven't seen real problems with this yet. Um, so I don't think we have to go to the nth degree yet confirming the identity of individuals. So here's some stuff that a colleague of mine put together when she had worked with um, people in substance abuse. And so she had asked and got some feedback from participants about some of the risks and digital health risks related to their lives. And I think it's instructive to think about the impact on the participants that you're actually studying and putting yourselves in their shoes. In some cases, you may know people, um, especially if it's your area of focus, you might know a whole heck of a lot about them and be really tuned in. This is why you're doing research in that area. Ask them and they'll give you good feedback. And so this was a, a number of things that I think people were really worried about, especially in substance abuse. You know, the, the prospect of physical harm. They have the phone on me and they get a text message related to research and it could lead to an outcome where somebody else finds out about something or thinks that they're a snitch and someone might react violently towards them. And you can get social harm. Somebody finds out that, you're, that you may have been using drugs in the past. You might be completely sober at that point, but if you were using drugs and someone finds out you're in a research study that's talking about that or giving you support, you may get fired. You may get ostracized, all because you got a notification or a text message. These things are really worrying to people. And then we have economic harms and legal harms. The legal one is particularly bad. Right now, we have a number of places in the United States that are doing research on undocumented individuals in the United States and the immigrant experience. OK. What happens if ICE walks in the door and tries to take your laptop, figure out who those people are, and then goes and finds them? Are you prepared? Have you disclosed that risk to them? Do you have things in your protocol that allow you to handle that? There are ways actually to handle that. But these are some of the, the harms and potential protections that you may want to put into your work. And it's not because you think ICE is going to barrel down into Microsoft Research and take your laptop. That would be really bold, <laughs> right? But you want to have thought through how you're protecting the people that you're gaining valuable knowledge about as you develop generalizable information you may want to publish or a new product or a new service. And so it's just thinking this stuff through and being thoughtful about it, you can do a better job. And these harms are real. Um, the one that I just mentioned about undocumented individuals is very real. Um, there is a way to get around it. I have seen attempts um, by agencies to go after researchers. And so that's not, uh, not make-believe. Okay, here are some of the other ones that are, uh, that are also inherent in, um, in mobile health and digital health research. The Hawthorne effect, which is we change our behavior because someone's watching us. This is true. I haven't seen anybody pick their nose today because, you know, there's kind of like people around you and like you're not going to pick your nose, right? And that's the Hawthorne effect. In some cases, digital solutions have a Hawthorne effect as an outcome. We want behavior change, right? 
we might want to help someone change their behavior that's more supportive of things that, that are goals in their life, better health, more efficient work product, getting along well with others, you name it, anything. And so sometimes the whole point is the Hawthorne effect. Um, but it is a risk. The more fun one is the anti-Hawthorne effect, which is I gave you permission to track what I'm doing and collect data about me, totally forgot that you're doing it, and then I disclosed way more than I really am comfortable with disclosing to you. This could happen in social media. I gave you access to my social media, you're kind of watching it, and you know, then around Thanksgiving, I went home and like, you watched me have a flame war on Facebook with my relatives. And like, I'm kind of embarrassed and I really wish I hadn't disclosed that and I really wish you didn't see it. So that would be you know, a case of the anti-Hawthorne. Um, the worst case of the anti-Hawthorne might include something like location-based services and tracking and you know, the wife goes to work in the morning and the husband has the tracker, and if she goes to work, the husband goes next door. Okay, the mistress effect. I get it. Probably not what that person wanted to disclose when they agreed to have location, location tracking and, you know, during the day to see their path of travel, right? Um, because now the researcher is you know, asking about kind of the things you do during the day and going, oh, so at 9.30 every morning you seem to go next door. What are you doing? Oh, I'm working out with my neighbor. Oh, sure you are. Um, so these are, not, these are things that we just have to be thinking of, and they're emergent properties based on the tech that we have and our ability to do things that, you know, in the past we were never able to capture that kind of information. It might have been self-reporting. It might have been a, a diary of what did you do every day, and you know the subject is not going to say I'm going over next door and been, you know, stepping out on my spouse. Um, so those are the kinds of things we need to be careful of. The next part is this efficiency, really efficient technology. Technology is wonderful at giving us efficiency. Transaction efficiency is like chief amongst that, right? And if you create something that's really efficient, you've usually done something pretty reasonable and pretty interesting, right? Everybody's goal is to scale something good um, and to have a positive impact. But if you design something and it goes wrong, you've just scaled something wrong too. It is a, it is a very, very double-edged sword. And we need to be very aware of how we design our systems and our products and our services to make sure we don't accidentally, or when something goes wrong, create really efficient, diffusable non-compliance or harm. And sometimes this includes adding extra steps to things, even when you, in you know, a perfect world, would not want to because you'd want it to be efficient. But you may design steps to slow something down just to ensure something doesn't go wrong. Sure, when you're done with the research and you've proven everything out, maybe when it goes to become something else or get it put out into the world, maybe that step goes away because you've been able to prove to yourself that it's not an issue. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have scaled noncompliance? And the best example I have of scaled noncompliance is really simple. And it also, uh, full disclosure, includes a Microsoft product. But it's a product everybody uses. So we have a researcher. researcher has a cohort of individuals that are participating in their study, and they have permission under their protocol to send them messages and reminders about completing a survey. Really fine, right? And they've collected all their email addresses, and they're allowed, and they have the permission to email their own participants and remind them on Monday morning to please fill out this survey. This is as boring and vanilla as it gets. So the researcher gets up, comes into the office, sits down, and sends out the email to participants reminding them what to do. Within 15 minutes, the IRB is getting a slew of phone calls and complaints, both by email and on the phone. Lo and behold, this young woman had walked in. She hadn't had her coffee yet. It's 9 a.m. She sits down. She fires Outlook up. She takes her Excel spreadsheet, copies all those email addresses, and puts them into the CC line instead of the BCC line on Outlook. They're right above one another, right? That's a HIPAA disclosure to every single person. They have the name and contact information by email of all the other participants. So we have a giant HIPAA release on our hands. Right? I get this. It comes into me. I look at it. OK, what are we going to do? And I go and I, read, I look into it. And I copy and I paste and I count the number of email addresses. 479. 479 HIPAA releases. Why does it matter? This is why you should always be talking to your IRB, because we all know these things and we're here to help. 
At 500, it's mandated public reporting to the media that you had a HIPAA release. <laughs> so 21 people shy of the institution having to put out into the New York Times or the Daily News or the Washington Post that like, oops, we disclosed a whole bunch of people's private information, right? So these are the kinds of things that occur. Really efficient, diffuse noncompliance. Didn't mean it, wasn't intentional. This person was lovely, does great work. It just so happens, CC, not BCC, right? So we, we have to be thoughtful about our own processes to try to design these things so we don't put ourselves in a position to have a screw up that we never intended to happen. Um, the last part on here is this blurring between what is minimal risk or not. And this comes back to regulatory stuff. We have this whole description of what's counted as minimal risk research. We also have a description of all the things that are exempt from review. IRBs make these determinations, not researchers. You can't just like decide, you know, my definition of minimal risk is, you know, I'm a doctor and I'm really good at doing lumbar punctures. It's not risky because I'm so good at it. No. That is greater than minimal risk to take a needle this big and put it into someone's spinal column and take out cerebral spinal fluid. Sorry, your definition of minimal research is not real. So this is something that we have to be aware of because in technology research, it actually could be a real risk. If you wanted to take an entire EMR system, all of the data and records from it, upload it into a cloud service, and then do a number of analysis on it, machine learning analysis to try to look for certain patterns. You know, you, that's worthwhile research to do. In fact, it's the frontier of stuff that's going to provide us real learning and insight. But if you then tell me that you want to upload the entire EMR of 45,000 to 55,000 patients' medical records through an FTP site, I'm going to flip out. Because this is really not minimal risk method to uploading all the data. Because that data has extreme value and is very risky in the wrong hands and risky when it's in flight. Right? So what I had someone asked to do this. And I said to them, you know, I would be much more comfortable if you put that onto a hard disk and put it in an armored truck and drove it over to the place and then uploaded it directly. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, well, think about the value and the risk related to the entire EMR. People hold these things hostage from people for millions of dollars. You think that, you know, I want you to go upload huge summaries of all this stuff, even if you say it's encrypted, through some other method? No securely transmit it. Well, oh, but, but that would take me an hour. I don't care, it would take you an hour, but we would be positive that nothing would happen to it and that would give everybody a lot more ease of mind and you would be caring for the data properly. So this is the kind of stuff where large amounts of data, or very large amounts of data, may cross over from being really minimal risk to greater minimal risk. And it really depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. And so be mindful of that. Try to mitigate those risks because you wouldn't want anything bad to happen, not under your watch. And so, you know, temper the desire to do things quick, right? And try to do it in a way that you think will do the most to ensure that things don't go wrong for you or for others. Okay. And the last little bit on this, on the, on the, the risks, is really about um, what kind of stuff is sort of coercive or undue influence, things we talked about before, mandating things from people. Um, in other parts of the world, there are actually rules that say you can't really mandate somebody to tell you something in research unless it's directly related to the research you're doing. And under HIPAA, we actually try to enforce that as well. You can't collect HIPAA-protected information unless you've got a real reason. So you can't just say, you know, I'm really interested in how people behave online, so I want to collect everything from them all the time. Uh, okay, well, why? What are you doing? What are the analyses? Like, what are you trying to Give me some more detail. Um, and this is, this is becoming more and more common. This is also one of the reasons we wound up with GDPR. So this is not going away. It's going to force us all to be more descriptive on what we're doing. And that's a good thing, because that's going to create better science, better results, better products, better services. OK. Another comment on the vulnerability part about all this within the, these kind, this kind of research. We need to be much more aware of how people are very different from us. Most people have Facebook. Depending on how old you are and how much of an adopter you are, a lot fewer people will have Snapchat. It trends a lot younger. And people's behaviors on these systems are very different. 
based on who they are. Children behave differently than adults do. Generation Z, so the individuals born after 1996, have vastly different behaviors in their online life and their digital life than millennials or Gen X uh, or the baby boomers. They actually hide things. They're very secretive and protective. Often will have multiple profiles. Here's the profile that all my parents are on and my family members. And then here's the other one that's like me and five, five of my closest friends and we share all kinds of things on it. They also don't seem to engage uh, in reaching out for help on things quite as often. It's actually going to become a significant problem in healthcare because they're kind of keeping from people the problems that they have and then not seeking out to get help for those issues. So we have to be very aware of that. We also have to be aware of how the solutions that we create and the research that we do either could lend itself to cyberbullying or not. Um, we've had a number of cases nationally where that's flared up and it's been pretty terrible. Thankfully, none of them happened uh, during research, but it's completely possible. Um, and we need to think about the different situations that people find themselves in. For example, you have given somebody a mobile device that they're doing research on, and the person is 16, and you have consent to do it, and it's pediatric research, totally fine. That part's covered. But then they start doing research activities while they're at school and they're in public school. I don't know. Do we have a problem with FERPA? Are you now doing research in a school setting? I don't know. So we need to think about the situations that people find themselves in. And some of this could be as easy as in the consent form and in the information that you're telling them, say, hey, please do this stuff at home in a quiet place. Please don't do it at school. Right? So give it, you can solve some of these issues by just being thoughtful and a little bit directive. It's not going to ruin the science if they take the survey at home, then, then they take it on recess during school. So we need to think about these things. Um, they're relatively important. And because we no longer are strictly in the controlled environment of a research setting where someone's physically in person with someone, we now can have them virtually anywhere on the planet. Thinking about the situations in which they may find themselves becomes critical to us understanding the risks related to the research. OK. So here's some scary and interesting things. This is maybe a year old, not even. This is what happens when you ask Siri about an escalation um, in mental health issues. The first one, we got, Siri, what do I do if I'm sad? Siri makes fun of me. It's OK to cry if you want to. My Luma silicate glass screen uh, is tear resistant. Ooh, yeah, great. Step it up a notch. What do I do if I'm depressed? So anybody in the clinical environment, someone says they're depressed, um, you don't respond and say, eh, flippantly, maybe you should talk to somebody about it. And then full-scale suicidal ideation. What do I do if I'm feeling suicidal? Siri, last year, punted and gave a Google search result for this. This is not what we need to have happen with our solutions. Anybody in mental health will tell you this is not the way to respond to these three things. There are ways to respond to this. There are good ways to respond to this. One of the ways that I thought was interesting, um, and we'll come back to this group again, was this group Crisis Text Line. They had mental health counselors on the other end, and 24-7 you could text them and have a conversation in a hot moment to try to calm down with an actual human being. It was really kind of a neat way to do it. And you know, it seemed a little bit better than this. But what we do know is that people feel less threatened by talking to a digital assistant. Because it's not a person. They don't feel the judgment of that person. They feel like they can ask that question quietly. It's kind of like all the stuff you really don't know about. You can Google it to try to find something out because you maybe don't want to ask another human being. Very true. So this is what is going on now. So I decided this was, I did this maybe a week ago. I updated these. And I asked them of a multiple digital assistants. And so I can play these. Hopefully it'll play. Hey, Siri. And you'll see how I deal with Siri. Who hey, I... Siri. Hey, Three Siri. Time. Hey, Siri. Finally. What should I do if I'm sad? Life, as I understand it, is sad, beautiful, and everything in between. <laughs> OK. What should I do if I'm feeling depressed? OK, I found this on the web for what should I do if I'm feeling depressed. What should I do if I'm depressed? 
I'm very sorry, JB. Maybe it would help to talk to someone about it. What should I do if I'm feeling suicidal? It sounds like talking with someone might help. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline has confidential, one-on-one -on -one support, 24 hours a day. Would you like me to call them for you? No. Okay. They changed it. A month ago, that wasn't how they did it. They changed it. They didn't tell anybody they changed it. We have no idea who they consulted on it, if anybody. But you also notice the first two in the escalation, they still kind of like make fun of you when you express sorrow or even depression. But they nailed it now with suicidal ideation. They even did the call. Do you want me to call them now? Yes, no, right there. This is, this is less than a month old that they put that in there. I know because I check every once in a while. Unfortunately, I didn't record it for the la every month for the last year, but they keep changing it and People in the professions seem to have no input on this. That's wild. The real impact on people. Lots of people ask that question of digital assistance. Why? In a moment of vulnerability, that's something they want to know about. And it's available to them and it's not threatening to them. So there's lots of solutions that I'm sure many people are doing research on and working on are kind of like this. Right? So let's go to the next one. I had to. I, I had to buy the like the pretty one with the like the wood siding. It was just it just looks so nice. I, I couldn't I couldn't help myself. So let's see let's see how uh, how the Amazon Alexa does this. Echo, what should I do if I'm sad? Sorry, I don't know that. Oh, craps out. What do I do when I'm sad? Echo, what should I do if I'm feeling depressed? I'm so sorry you are feeling that way. Please know that you're not alone. There are people who can help you. You could try talking with a friend or your doctor. You can also reach out to the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance at 800-826-3632 for more resources. Not bad. Echo, what should I do if I'm feeling suicidal? I'm not quite sure how to help you with that. Okay. So, Siri... Not so good up until suicidal ideation, and then nails it. Alexa, not good with sadness, not good with suicidal ideation. Sorry, I don't know how to help you, but pretty much perfect with depression. Okay, that seems a little mixed. Let's see how Google does. Hey Google, what should I do if I'm sad? I get upset when we disconnect. Hey Google, what should I do if I'm feeling depressed? It really doesn't want to do it. I wish I had arms so I could give you a hug. But for now, maybe a joke or some music might help. Oh, okay. Hey Google, what should I do if I'm depressed? The possibilities are endless, but I've got something to take your mind off the big decision. Want to hear a fun fact? Hey Google. What should I do if I'm depressed? It's Let's start hours. with what you should do today. I can help you find fun things to do. Just ask. Hey Google, what should I do if I'm feeling depressed? Oh no, it may not be much, but let me know if there is anything I can do for you. Hey Google, what should I do if I'm feeling suicidal? You are not alone. Help is available for free at National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Call 1-800-273-8255. There you go. Google Assistant, four different responses to the thing about depression. All of them dodges, or in some cases, making fun of you, right? And then it gets right to the suicidal ideation one. So it looks a lot like Siri in terms of it gets right the one at the, at the highest end, and it bungles up the rest of them. And then the Amazon Alexa gets the middle one right, and it bungles up on those side. Um, I haven't tried Cortana. <laughs> um, not because I was coming here today, but because I, I don't have access to Cortana. I don't currently have a, um, a Microsoft laptop or device to, to test it on. Um, but this is a problem. And these things change without consultation of, of society. And you can see they're doing things in very different ways without us really knowing what's going on. So you want to be mindful as you're creating things and doing research of 
the fact that there's a lot of this black box out there and that we can do better. And it's not, that, it's not that the people that are working on the voice assistants need to be beaten over the head or told they're awful. I'm sure that they had some reason for why they wanted to do this. I'm sure they were trying. But we need to support this kind of stuff and actually have it get better. Because there are real expectations in other fields of inquiry about how to do this. You sit down with a, a reasonable psychiatrist, psychologist, cl clinical social worker, therapist, you name it, and they'll tell you, no, 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 here's how you handle this, right? And, and I promise it's the right way to handle it. Um, and you can do it. OK. So that was the risk-benefit part. Now here's the justice part. And the justice part actually has some good news in it. Um, and the good news about the justice part is that now with the availability of devices and these services, we actually can get recruitment for research anywhere. We've made it a lot easier to be involved. We can diffuse things a lot better. Our access issues are going down. We can start to make it so that we don't just do research on white upper middle class white people in urban centers. Right? We actually can do research on the people who need the actual outcomes and the benefit of the work and the solutions and the technology we create. And we can now find them because of access. And I think that's a big deal. Um, I think it's a huge deal and something to be very happy with and proud of. And I think it's something that our technology industry has done. And they've carried the load on this really, really, really well. Um, so we need to capitalize on it in a very good way. We still have some challenges. There's a lot of biases that come into it. For example, if you own an iPhone, uh, the average iPhone uh, owner and user, uh, the demographics that I'm in the United States is they have eighty-five dollars to $95,000 a year in family income and up. And they are white, and they live in more urban areas. Hmm. OK, so if you're building solutions that only work on the iPhone, when 70 plus 80 plus percent of society uses an Android device, uh, you're probably missing something, right? So we need to think about make, meeting people where they are and having our solutions work across all things. Um, and that's where some of these SDKs and some of these open source things are actually helping. So Research Kit um, is that one I talked about that is on the iPhone. There's an equivalent being built called Research Stack that's out there that allows you to do some of this, these research kinds of activities. Um, and it looks and feels the same way as the iOS version on Android. Um, and then you know, I'm part of a company and we're building something that goes across all three. Um, and we're going to have an open source release of, of our back end for some of this as well. Um, and it's just important for justice reasons. We need to pe meet people where they are um, with technology that helps them and is useful to them. And if we use that as a design principle in our research, we are not going to recreate the problems of these biases and this differentiation around socioeconomic status or access to technology. So if you have it as a design principle up front, as an ethical and moral and technology mandate, you have a better chance of contributing something special and something useful. OK. This is an example of a form that I found really helpful. And it was a form that helps you think through all the data elements and things that uh, go into your research. And it's in use at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I think it's wonderful. And you are very lucky here at Microsoft. You are lucky because this was developed by two really smart, thoughtful people at the University of Pittsburgh. One was somebody in the IRB office. And the other one was their chief information security officer from the University of Pittsburgh, who now works for Microsoft. So, you know, you went and you, you, you picked off someone really good and you, know, you recruited them over here. Um, so you have a lot of in-house expertise and really bright people who are really thoughtful and helpful. Um, and you have access to them. They're part of your, they're part of your corporate family. So uh, there, is, there, is, there is hope with a lot of this stuff. And there's people who have looked through some of these things uh, and have some of those insights. Um, you also have an IRB who knows this and who knows how to handle this stuff, and who knows how to deal with it, and to counsel you when you're designing your research. And that's where we're going next. We need to have these cautions. Caution being, don't recreate the same problem. We talked about this. Our, we don't want to look at the processes we had in the past and merely replicate them with more expensive equipment and solutions that are the same. We want to open up the problem that it was. We want to look at it, and we want to say, how do we actually resolve it? Was there any negative impacts of the way that it was done in the past? How can we do it better? And that's a critical thing to do. And that, that classic example is we don't just want to create it so that it's upper middle class white people that get the benefit. How do we make it a benefit to everybody? 
Right? So that's a, a classic example for it. We also want to have some real caution about big data. And I don't know, everybody uses different terms now. It used to be the data warehouse, then it was the data lake. I'm waiting for somebody to claim it's a data ocean. Um, then there's going to be a data planet and data constellation. I don't know. We, we keep trying to up our ante with this. There's a, a classic study in research ethics, and it's a real problem. It was this woman, Henrietta Lacks. And Henrietta Lacks and her family had an issue where um, many decades ago, a uh, tumor sample was taken from her and blood sample was taken from her and it was turned into an immortal cell line. And that cell line was used to create a large number of therapies uh, and a large amount of scientific discovery was, was done on the back of, of her cells. And they didn't get proper consent for it. And they also did not give her any of the benefit of the things that they learned and the therapies that they developed, including things that could have helped her with her cancer. That's wrong. It's very wrong. Question is, what are we in for when we do that with big data? When you get a large amount of data about people and then you learn something, you get an insight and you either create a product or a solution, but the people who you got that information from get no benefit from it. Is that okay? I argue it's not. And that we are at a point now where if we think about it, we can do better. But if we don't, we're going to have a real problem. We're going to recreate that Henrietta Lacks moment, but we're going to do it at scale in big data, in AI, machine learning. These are the areas where I think we're going to have that issue. And those problems could be similar kinds of scaled issues that were legal, social, ethical uh, issues that came up in Henrietta Lacks. Unfortunately, we already have an example. This year, the health technology company Flatiron Health was acquired for over $2 billion by Roche. And you see there in bold, the thing that they were the most interested in was this really important structured and unstructured oncology data. Anybody with a data science background is like, ooh, lots of structured and unstructured data? Ooh, I can do lots of wonderful things with that. I can learn a ton. Great. So what did Flatiron Health do? Flatiron Health was a company that sold a technology product, which was an oncology-specific electronic medical record system for annotation and structuring of oncology data so that oncologists could better care for and understand the lab results, genetic results, and other results of their patients in a more deeply characterized manner so they could treat them better. It was a wonderful idea for a piece of tech, which means, as a technology company, they have the right, under their licenses, when they sell access to that platform for people to use, to look at that data, usually for businesses, business purposes, like how do we create better features in it? How do we debug it? How do we make sure that it works really well? How do we make sure it's interoperable? All the things that as a creator of a wonderful piece of tech you want to do and you are allowed to do under our structures and our laws and our rules. That seems normal. But... They sold themselves whole hog to a drug company who does oncology research, which means that drug company now walks in and for $2 billion purchased the complete annotated medical records of tens of thousands of cancer patients. To do what? Create drugs. Are those patients, did they consent to have their data be used in this fashion? Are they gonna get the benefit from Roche when Roche develops? New drugs? I doubt it. This is probably an example of Henrietta Lacks at scale. And the question is, as a large technology company, do you want to do something like that too, or do you want to be a little bit better about it? I'd argue you want to be better about it. Because if you were one of these people, or one of your family members was a cancer patient, and their medical records were just sold to Roche, because you don't realize that their oncologist was using the Onco-EMR from Flatiron that got bought by Roche, how happy would you be if your loved one who had metastatic cancer had this happen to their data and information? I don't think you'd be very happy. I know I'm not. So we have these kinds of problems. The last one is this one. Remember I mentioned this group? It's Crisis Text Line 24-7, texting them about a hot moment you're having or crisis moment, real person talking to you, helping you regain your composure, talking you off that ledge. Wonderful concept. They have the largest data set 
of mental health conversations through text message of anybody. This is like a dream to try to understand how people are communicating with one another about mental health in a moment of crisis. I mean, it's, it's finite, it's structured. I mean, this is like, you really can learn something. It's a nonprofit, too. The CEO of this nonprofit, in what I would consider personally an extraordinary act of self dealing, gave herself the intellectual property from that nonprofit and started a for profit company. I don't think people signed up for that. Even in their terms of use, which looked a lot like a EULA, doesn't seem to indicate that something like that could occur. And in addition, when you're having a moment of crisis, do you feel like you're capable of making an informed choice about whether or not could use, someone could use your data for something else? You're in a moment of crisis. You want to talk to somebody. You're going to do whatever you can to just, yes, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to agree. I'm going to agree to all these things because I'm, I'm having a problem. I want to talk to somebody. I want to like, work through this. So this, these are two issues that I think have already occurred on this sort of big data problem around Henrietta Lacks. OK. Probably gone through a lot of things that are scary or frightening or you know, things to be worried about. What do we, how do we bring this together? What do we do? You have this group that, overview, that reviews your research. It's an IRB. People try to avoid it. That's really dangerous. Try to avoid it, you can wind up lawsuits and jail time and all that nonsense. Um, take a team-based approach. Think of them as your partner. You're in an institution that has a lot of wonderful, brilliant researchers. And you're all really good at figuring things out and thinking things through and working together on it. Talk to the IRB early, very early. You're designing something up. Talk to them about what you're doing. It's not going to mean that they're going to come in and start bossing you around. You keep them apprised of what you're developing before you start re doing research on humans. They'll have a clue about what you're working on. Remember that concept about you're unfamiliar? Well, if they're unfamiliar with what you're doing, it's going to take longer to explain it to them when you go to them later. So if you're keeping them kind of informed what your group does as a whole and the kinds of work that you do, they'll be a lot more prepared to help you. So you, early and often is a good way to kind of talk to an IRB. Um, you need to be able to teach one another. They're going to teach you when they know about your research, hey, these are the three things you need to be aware of because these are the kinds of things that come up in the work that you do that's specific to you. Wouldn't you rather know that up front than to get surprised by it when you submit to get review and then you get this laundry list of problems back and you feel very defeated and angry? Yeah, you know, earlier you talked to them, they're like, oh, the kind of work you do, these are the most common issues. Please think about them up front. Great. Sounds good. You can do it in 20 minutes, right? Um, the next part is put down your sword. <laughs> put down your sword. There are a lot of egos in technology companies. Uh, let's like, you know, dial it back. The next thing, think about modular design. Adapt and reuse things. Your methodologies are often similar from one research study to the next. Groups develop expertise. Try to document a lot of this stuff so you can reuse things over and over again and know what kind of things got approved. So create systems where you can share that with one another internally and with others within your organization so that you can develop a community of practice where it's a lot easier for people to find examples instead of reinventing the wheel over and over again. And these are just a few examples of things you could do. Avoid researcher Stockholm syndrome. So researcher Stockholm syndrome is this notion that everybody is so special and gifted and, and, and wonderful that they all belong getting a Nobel Prize in Stockholm, Sweden. It's not Stockholm syndrome of loving your captor. It's the researcher Stockholm syndrome. I am so special. How dare you, IRB, get out of my way. Or I am wonderful and I'm going to win a Nobel Prize. No, that's not true. We all need to sort of back off. There are lots of really, really bright researchers in this world. That doesn't mean they know everything. So we kind of just need to acknowledge that, that sometimes that gets in the way. We need to let it pass. It's very Buddhist. You need to sort of experience it, let it pass when you run into that kind of thing, and then just move on. Um, so we need, we need that kind of stuff to calm down. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to get anything accomplished. In the reverse, 
This is often what people think of IRBs. <laughs> they're irrelevant, they're irreverent, they're incompetent, they're inconsistent. These are all the accusations you get. Well, it's a whole area that you don't know the work that they're doing, they don't know the work that you're doing, and it's often frustrating to you because you have expectations about how quickly you want to get stuff done. Technologists are, better, are quicker at building things than you know, a biochemist might be at developing a drug. And so you have the sense that just because I can build it quickly needs to be approved quickly. Well, it doesn't happen that fast. And so I think we've seen, as IRB people, I've been a chair before, I've seen these accusations lobbed at me for years. And I just have to let them roll off. Because I understand why people are frustrated and upset. It looks like a black box to them where they don't understand where some perspective is coming from. You, know, you call them back and you say, I can't have you do it this way. Why not? Because our laws don't let us do it that way. That's stupid. I understand your perspective, but I can't change the law, and we can't pretend that the definition of you know, reality is different than what it is. So work with me. Let's figure out a workaround. And there often are workarounds. There's often ways, if you describe it in better detail, that the regulators can help you design it better and go in a different direction or make it easier for you or have a solution where you can still do exactly what you want as your goal without it standing in the way. So we really need to have these conversations and they might be much more interactive, much more candid. Because remember, and this is important, the goal of an IRB is not to stand in front of your way. It's not to make you angry. It's not to police you. It has a mandated goal under the law to protect the participants. It's not to protect the institution. It's not to make sure that you win your next grant or get your next promotion or you know, win some huge award. No, their goal is to protect the participants. And so there's, there's a real mandate to it. And if it looks like something is running afoul of some rule or regulation somewhere, they have to deal with it. So be more collaborative so they can help you resolve it um, and kind of move past it. And then this is a series of recommendations. And you can read through these uh, at your own leisure later. Um, or if it's videotaped, you can pause and read them. These are some things you can put into your research protocols that will make it a lot easier for your stuff to get reviewed when you're creating technology. Putting things in graphic and tabular form for all of your data. Pro providing schematics that actually map out the logic of the systems or platforms you're creating so that somebody reviewing will understand the first thing about what you're doing. Um, being able to make a distinction between what I said earlier, something that's truly novel, something that's just a better version of the same old thing, or just teaching somebody the basics about something they're unfamiliar with. Somebody needs to read the whole thing and have a real clear understanding of what's going on before they can approve it. And this is going to challenge you to do some of that good writing. There's a dirty secret in here that's wonderful. If you do this kind of stuff, you write really good protocols, and you're planning on publishing something or pitching it to create it, you can use that really well-written protocol to do all that stuff. It's a good first draft of a paper. It's a good first draft of a business case and a proposal. It, it, it forces you to have that sort of synthesis around what you're doing and then present that information in an understandable way, which is a real skill worth developing. And so this process, if you, if you do it right, can actually help you in multiple ways in the rest of your job and the rest of your role. This is just an example of the kinds of questions that come up around the data, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, for people that collect a lot of data and anal analyze it, this may be really helpful for you as a template. Non-compliance, we talked a little bit about that before. If you create massive in uh, efficiency, you create massive non-compliance occasionally. Uh, the more you describe how you would handle potential non-compliance, then it becomes not even a case of it. So if you say there's a possibility of something occurring and then how you're going to handle it, when it occurs, it's not non-compliance because you predicted it. So many of you are really good at scenarios. Um, people who do user stories are wonderful at scenarios, right? And so you can think about the possible things that could go wrong, and you could plan in advance. And for certain groups who create different types of tech, you know what the typical things are, and you could actually come up with them ahead of time and reuse a lot of that stuff over and over and over again, probably for years, because you know your area so exquisitely well. So do yourself that favor. Write it out. Remember in the end that the ultimate goal here is better research. You want to have a clear understanding of how you do your work. You want to have better continuity during times of transition. These are all things that you can get as a result of 
developing better protocols, working better with the people who helped to do the oversight on research in humans, uh, and trying to be a little bit more thoughtful uh, about how you do it. The, this is what you get as a result and a value back to you when you take a team-based approach to review. And I'll leave you where we sort of started, which was the moral obligation, the thing you got to do. You do this kind of stuff, you can tackle parts of this problem. This is a legacy. You tackle parts of this problem, you can look yourself in the eye the rest of your natural living life and know you've done something valuable. That's worth it. That's a calling. And so I challenge people who do tech research to think about this and think about why we do it. Sure, you might make money along the way. Cool. Sounds good. Buy a Ferrari. I mean, I would buy a different car, but, you know, whatever. But uh, this is something you can actually get excited about. And when you're doing something that really works, you could be heading in this direction. Um, I probably have gone over time. Yes, I have. Okay. That's all I have. I'm happy to take some questions, but I realize that people probably have some place they got to run to. What's up, Fred? I don't know how many people are like watching there, too. Clef's super low, so it sounds good. I also just want to say Cortana.